We'll start with Charles Babbage. He was born in 1891. 1791, sorry. <coughs> Screw it up by 100 years. 1791. So you can figure by the time he's a thinking adult, he's in the midst of the Industrial Revolution in England. I like to call it the first Industrial Revolution because, in my humble opinion, computers were a second Industrial Revolution. Now, tables. You've all seen things like this, I think, you know. Mathematical tables. Very important for all sorts of things. But there's one area in which the British government was concerned. Seafaring nation. They were worried about the sh a ship going on the rocks because of a mistake in these tables they used for navigation. Now, I should also point out Industrial Revolution. Everything is being powered by steam. Electrical, electric lights have come in, but electric power not yet. And so steam was almost a metaphor for mechanization. Now, we get the legends. If you read it in the book, it's probably a legend. Uh, anyway, this was in a book written by a man named Doran Swade, who I'll tell you about later. And in his book, the story is that in 1831, Babbage is now 30 years old, he and an astronomer friend named John Herschel are comparing two different editions of a table, just reading the values out loud. And whenever the two values disagree, at least one table is a, has to be an error. And at some point, allegedly, Babbage is so exasperated that he exclaims to a fly on the wall, I wish to God these tables had been executed by steam. Well, two years later, he has figured out how to make a machine that will calculate these tables for him. Now, he hasn't invented the computer. Not yet. It turns out that expressions called polynomials can be good approximations to other functions over limited ranges. And in fact, for logarithm tables, it's particularly good. This machine, which is really a fancy adding machine, can calculate 3,000 seven-place logarithm values before we need to change the polynomial. Now, for those who don't know what a polynomial is, here's the Here's an example, and it's in fact the polynomial we've set up for this machine to calculate. The theory is, the story is, I don't know how it came to be, that this was Babbage's favorite polynomial because the first 40 values calculated, if you put in integer values of x, are all prime numbers. <laughs> I don't think we've checked that. So. Babbage gets a grant of 17,000 pounds from the British Treasury, which is some number of millions of dollars equivalent. He hires the best tool maker in the whole country, a man named Joseph Clement, and they set about making parts for this machine he has designed. After nine years of fabricating parts, they have enough parts to build a small working model. It's about so big square and so high, and you probably saw it in that video. It resides in the Science Museum in London, which inherited all of Babbage's drawings and artifacts. It is not a big enough machine, doesn't have enough powers of X in the polynomial or significant digits in the polynomial to do anything useful. But it's enough of a model to demonstrate that its mechanisms work. It adds when it should add, and the carries take place as they should take place, and so on. That's after nine years. On year 10, the whole project collapses in a heap because both Babbage and Clement are very hard to get along with, with anybody who disagrees with them and they disagree with each other. It turns out Babbage wants Clement to move, relocate his shop closer to Babbage's home. 
this involves paying Clement some money for his trouble, that this agreement is how much money. At that point, this demonstration machine is in Babbage's home. It can't be touched. But all the other parts that Clement has made under British law, they belong to him. He probably melts them down to scrap. And that's just the end of that difference. Actually. Well, Babbage at this point, having had the experience of designing this machine, has much greater ambitions. Would you believe? He believes he can make a machine that will add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Now, addition implies subtraction. I'll go to that later. But the point is it will multiply and divide. And it can store numbers in a number of column registers. It can obey a program that comes in on punch cards, which tells it what, what operation to do and what number and where to store the result. Now, when I say cards, I don't mean these little cardboard things. I mean the cards of the jacquard loom, wooden things about so long and so wide with little circular holes in them, and all tied together with thread so that it's like a deck of cards, but it's just a continuous, you know, like a Venetian blind. Well, and finally, that machine can skip instructions, thus branching in two directions in a program based on the value in one of those stored numbers, probably whether it's zero or not, but it's, it's the rational decision. That man has just invented the computer. It has every attribute of today's computer. The only thing is, nobody paid any attention. So it had no influence on today's computer, but everybody agrees. Well, about nine years into designing this thing, which he called the analytic engine, he decides that he can make a difference engine with one third the number of parts of the original design. The original design was going to have about 24,000 parts. This machine has 8,000. Now, 4,000 are in this section, which calculates, where you can see there's a lot of repetition. This section is in part which will impress the numbers into plaster of Paris, a stereotype mold into which type metal can be poured. So you get a whole page of a table untouched by human hands, therefore error free. And it will also print it for checking the value on this strip of paper here. Some people are going to ask me, we don't put ink in the roller, it will take four hours to clean the machine up. And we don't have plaster for us. We don't really do it. Well, at that point, he approaches the British Treasury for some money. And they say, thanks, but no thanks. And so this machine doesn't get built. It just, he just has a lot of drawings and which the London Museum inherits. Okay, let's jump ahead now to 1985. The London Museum has hired a curator of computing, a man named Doran Swade, whose name I mentioned before, and he has fire in his belly about this machine. He believes that Babbage could have built it and made it work if he had gotten the funds. And there were other historians who disagreed because there was no mass production in England of identical stuff. And they said, no way. And Babbage, and Doran decides to prove his point by building the machine. He starts raising money. And in a book he wrote, one of the most amusing pages where was part of the money raising experience where he literally blackmailed 30,000 pounds out of IBM. <laughs> that kind of delighted me. Well, they managed, it took them six years, they built the machine and were able to demonstrate it in 1991, the 200th anniversary of Babbage's birth. Now, they only had enough money to build this much. So, now we're, we're back to legend because I don't know the details. As I understand it, Bill Gates sees the machine and they try to approach him for some funds to build this. And he declines but he puts him in touch with a man named Nathan Meyervold. And Nathan 
was Babbage, uh, <laughs> excuse me, was Microsoft's chief technical officer before he retired. So he has pots of money. Well, there's a long exchange of emails, and Nathan finally makes the London Museum an offer they can't refuse. He says, I will pay for building two of these and one more of these, because I'd like to have that machine in my living room. <laughs> Which I'm told is a bit of a museum. There's a dinosaur skeleton in it, among other things. It then came to pass that the chairman of the board of trustees of the museum persuaded him to lend it to us for one year. And so, in the spring of 2008, it arrived at our front door, I might say in deplorable condition, like some of the screws which hold the frame together were in the oil pan because nobody had had experience shipping a thing like this by air. And uh, the f I understand the first time they turned the crank, six things called carry levers broke. And they're very expensive, they're very fragile, and if you look at them too hard, they break. But anyway, we got the machine adjusted and working. And the next year, around Christmas time, uh, no, earlier than that, early December, we asked for a one-year extension and we got it. And this is going on year after year after year. So until December 15th of this year, we didn't know we, whether we would have it in 2000, of last year, we didn't know whether we would have it in 2012. So, okay, with that intro, let's, everybody to my right here, to that side of me, go behind, please. <laughs> 